Thank you. So namehi, namehi aroha, and the mana nere on the karanga maha toa tene kato katoa. Konati to my toenga te iwi, no wairapa ho, no inga rangi oku tupuna, ko Martin Drens with toku inga, no reira tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. So I'm just opening the way for my presentation this afternoon. Um, I'm proudly call myself and so do my colleagues, as does Peter, part of Ngāti Tumatuenga, which is what we in the New Zealand Army call ourselves since 1995. I also am very proud of my heritage, which is uh, on my mother's side from the West Riding in Yorkshire. So I see James Bellich is here this afternoon and referred to it last night in his, in his talk. And on my father's side, a, a sort of coal miners from South Yorkshire. Um, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this afternoon, but I, I would like to start off by saying really been impressed and I'd like to congratulate all those who put this program together. What a rich tapestry. Um, and I really did uh, re resonate with, with the points which were brought out yesterday, particularly the use of, of, of song uh, within telling the story, uh, the storytelling, whether it be at schools or to the future, as I've got two Mokopuna who are half Samoan, half uh, um, uh, Pākehā. Uh, so it's really important that they know their story as, as they are New Zealanders, new New Zealanders and also through the artists, because um, I noticed in Timor in particular that art was a really important way of them expressing their mamai and through music expressing their mamai. So it's common to all peoples uh, and all of those who were the artists yesterday. I really, I really appreciated the words you spoke. So thank you very much. So um, if I can move on to, my, to what I want to talk about this afternoon. Um, this slide is really just a, a reflection of what, what John, I, I feel very privileged uh, that I've had the opportunity to serve over the last quarter of a century around the world. And this afternoon I'm going to specifically talk to my experiences and I have to emphasise, my these are my personal opinions on many cases, they're not necessarily those of the Defence Force, uh, which has probably been a mark of my career why I'm still only a Lieutenant Colonel. But, but, um, <laughs> But, but also, um, I did refer to the mamai um, earlier, which is the hurt uh, of, of our indigenous, uh, of Māori uh, and also Pacific Islanders within our, within our country. And I remember my daughter constantly telling me off that I was spending all my time uh, supporting those who, have been, who are suffering the scars of war, and in particular what Ruth Nuttall talked to this morning, and I will advertise her book, Where is Ruth? Um, who, who I, I'm not going to, um, I'm going to embarrass you now, Ruth, but I've served for six years in Timor-Leste, and Ruth Nuttall is one of the heroes for what she did in 2006. She brought people who were scared, who were in fear of their lives, into her compound. And also, um, if you go to Don Bosco in, in, uh, in uh, Dili, uh, the priests there always talk about Ruth Nuttall and what she did in terms of helping them putting in place the infrastructure for the refugees. So, Ruth, namihi, namihi, namihi. Thank you for, for what you did there, and I'm, I apologise for embarrassing you. <laughs> um, so, uh, I will start with this in the sense that we do try and, and learn from the mistakes of the past. We do write what we call doctrine, which is sort of the, the principles. Uh, within the New Zealand Army, I'd like to think that we... We look at the, we read the doctrine and then apply it as, as, as we should. Rommel, the very famous German general, said the, the British have the best doctrine. Fortunately, they don't read it. Um, we do try and, and, and do that. And, and those are really important points. So those are the principles that I will refer to as I go through my presentation this afternoon. But in particular, the last one, which in my book is probably the most important, the most critical, is how can we assure we're all on the same page by all I'm actually talking the priority is the host nation, the people of the country that we, we move into. And that was a really important point, which is brought out by our speakers this morning in terms of how we dealt with Bougainville and some of the quotes which were put on the screen this morning from Don McKinnon. I mean, that is the doctrine. That slide, I saw somebody taking a photograph, but unfortunately I'd taken my mobile phone off, so I couldn't take it. But those quotes are really pertinent to the way in which we should operate when we go overseas. Are we all on the same sheet of music? But more importantly, have we changed that sheet of music to the conditions? 
So um, in 2013, when I came back from Timor-Leste as the Chief Military Liaison Officer um, um, with 16 different nations under my command, which was really interesting, the eclectic nature and approaches of all those individuals uh, to the way we did peacekeeping. Amira Hart was my boss. She was the SRSG, a wonderful woman, uh, has got my full admiration, and we're still close personal friends. But she, I invited her to speak at a conference, Pacific Army Chiefs Conference, and those are the points she brought up in terms of the complexities that we were facing at the time. Now, I have to add um, that it's important to note that Professor Alexander Gillespie, in his presentation yesterday, probably added two or three points to this list as we've moved from um, some of those points around a multidimensional mandates, but in increasingly violent and asymmetric threats Particularly in the 90s, we were focusing on the United Nations operations, then we moved into what we call the war on terror, and now we're moving into potentially the threshold of nuclear war. So we're in, we're in a bad state in that particular case. So those are the challenges, but what I want to try and do this afternoon is say, where are the opportunities? And I was really pleased that the speakers before lunchtime, most of them had an optimism, at least for our region, if not the world. But what I want to ask, and I constantly ask, and uh, my good friend Anna Pauls is in the, in, the, in the audience, and we worked together on a, on a book which came out of that conference in 2014, 2015, was what do we expect of our military commanders? Because when we went into Timor-Leste, it was ground zero. Everything had been burnt. The Indonesians had taken everything and the militia across the border. And we were the people on the ground. So we were there not only to provide the security but also we were sort of empowered for nation building. And this became even more apparent when we went into Bamiyan in Afghanistan after years of infighting between Mujahideen and the various warlords who had destroyed that country. Again, we were the people on the ground. And there was some money given to us, but there was no people, no resources. New Zealand sent a military force to Afghanistan and expected us not only to do the security piece, but also the nation building piece and also the governance piece. When, Amira, uh, when um, Hariba Sarabi, who was the governor of, of Bamiyan, um, the deputy commander came up to uh, visit us in Bamiyan, and, um, and Eikenberry, who was the ambassador, and Eikenberry said to her, who do you look to for your political advice and for development, con the development construction? And she turned to me. I think that's wrong. So that's my first question. The second one is, when we go into train national security forces, those we were supposed to be training in Timor-Leste had just come out of the hills. They were guerrilla fighters. And we were given three years to turn them into an army and into a military force. And secondly, when we were in Afghanistan, similarly, they didn't have an army. So I'm going to talk uh, briefly. And, and John, can you sort of give me a 10 minutes to go warning as well, please? Because I, I don't want to go off on a trail and miss out Afghanistan. So I think we had a really good presentation. Ruth, fantastic this morning. I'm really looking forward to reading your book. So I don't need to go into the history behind and the Mai Mai, which comes of um, ethnic cleansing, which has occurred to some extent uh, in that country over three different campaigns, the Portuguese, the Japanese, and then the Indonesians, and in large numbers. But we went in there. Uh, thank Christ we went in there, excuse me, um, because um, and it was lucky that we did. You know, we were, Habibi Sarabi had taken, uh, not Habibi, sorry, uh, Habibi had taken over. And um, there was an opportunity, a really small window of opportunity. We were running APEC conference here in, in Auckland. Uh, Clinton was here, um, uh, Pr uh, Prime Minister Howard, and, um, and they forced the issue that we needed to put a peacekeeping force into there because the referendum had really gone badly. Hundreds of people were being killed. Um, I do um, see the comparisons between our history and their history. Um, in particular, uh, the Rangiaofia Church um, story that we heard yesterday on, on, from two different people happened in Suai. And one of my close personal friends was there just before it happened when 186 Timorese were killed, including women and children, inside the church in the massacre which was orchestrated and complied with, with Indonesian police on the outskirts, with military and the militia 
actually putting it in place. Unforgivable. But he was there just before that because he'd been part of the referendum process and he was refusing to leave because the UN came up with the message, you've got to leave. It's too dangerous. We're bringing all of the observers back. And um, he was then ordered to leave. And as they got up on the helicopter, he saw the vehicles being burnt. And minutes later, as they flew away, it happened on the ground. Those are the sorts of traumatic situations that we as a military force find ourselves in if we're not supported appropriately. However, we went in 20 days late, I have to say, but we did go in as the Interfet Force, and these are pretty graphic photographs, and I apologise for that. Um, but we basically went in heavy to secure the peace at that particular point in time. And ladies and gentlemen, that was a success. However, and I agree with Ruth here, the untied mission... I'll let you read that slide. Sorry, 10 minutes, thank you. But my biggest problem with this particular mission was that it got, we got distracted. So why did it... Why, well, let me first of all go on the successes. Peter made sure I put successes in there as well because we were both battalion commanders mm -hmm. on the ground. The successes were that we enabled repatriation of thousands of Timorese. In our sector in the south of the border, we repatriated over 35,000 who had been pushed across... Uh, in fear or, or had been pushed across by the militia or by the Indonesian Defence Force. We removed the militia, militia threat. My battalion in particular, we found ourselves in a firefight, ironically, with the militia who came from the Manafahi uh, and from Same, which Ruth talked to this morning. We provided security on the border um, and we developed a working relationship with the Indonesians and we allowed the elections to proceed. But we then left far too early and it fell apart. And I'm not going to go into details here because Ruth talked about it. But I will give you a couple of points as to why. And I personally believe that part of it was that we trusted the leadership. So Nana Gujmao is a charismatic man, if you've met him. And so is Ramos Horta. Ramos Horta was the diaspora who was overseas, constantly pushing the barrow for the Timorese situation, which largely fell on deaf ears. Uh, started with the Santa Cruz massacre in 1992. There was an awareness because a Yorkshire TV pro uh, film producer was there, managed to smuggle the film out, but not really until the referendum. But what we didn't do was understand the Timorese <coughs> history, culture, and society. We heard about that this morning, so I don't want to dwell on it because I do want to get to Afghanistan. But the, the end state was too short to enable us to put in place effective governance, to put in effective, effective security sector. And it culminated in the death of eight policemen um, who were killed by the army, the FFDTL, under a UN flag, disarmed. That is the situation which we found ourselves in when we went in. Now, I'm going to be very brief on the, this, but unmit which was the, um, the, the force that I was part of, and Anna, you were as well, I think you did some work there, um, was a success largely. And part of that was because we spent six years training up their police force. Now, Ruth did refer to some of the policemen we put in there from the United Nations weren't policemen, I get that. But Zanana Gujmao did make one really good decision, and that was that he said, I want my police force to be effective 18 months before the UN police leave. So whilst the UN police weren't that effective in training up their police force, at least there was, a, there was something sitting behind them for 18 months, which we didn't do in Afghanistan, which is where I'm going to move to now. Success. I think it's widely accepted. The first phase was successful in the sense that al-Qaeda became ineffective in terms of its ability to operate, uh, and, and it was in reaction to the Twin Towers. Again, heavy military force, short duration, fine. Second phase, success or failure. I'm going to change track now because I actually think the New Zealand PRT was a success. I'm not going to say the mission across Afghanistan was a success, but I believe we did a good job. And I really want to push that, especially to our veterans, because I don't want another repeat of Vietnam where we feel we had to come back in the cloak of darkness, failed mission, and we lost 12 people there. And their mothers, their fathers, their brothers and sisters think it was for nothing. 
It's really important that New Zealand understands that we did a good job there because we used the same sort of skill sets that we did in Bougainville. First one, you have to find out who the charismatic leaders are in any culture. And the charismatic lead leaders were ex-Mujahideen, Mullahs, Malawis. There was Tajiks, there was Azara. You've got to get in there and work at the grassroots because the district administrators have got no influence because they had been appointed out of Kabul. You have to listen, learn, negotiate and deliver. Three cups of tea. First cup of tea is, is um, because it's hospitality, very important in Afghan culture. Second cup of tea is because they actually quite like you. Third cup of tea, you're now part of their family and they will protect you to the death. So you've got to wait for the third cup of tea. You've got to take the time. As the Taliban said when we left, you've got the watches, we've got the time. You've just got to slow down and take the time. It doesn't help when you've got six month deployments. So basically we went into a heavy nation building and Barmin really did benefit. New roads. There is nothing more important to the Afghans than the survival of their babies. And so we worked on that principle. And throughout Barmin, we were able to construct, with American money, um, a lot of health facilities. We also put in place schools. Now, the red dot in the top right-hand corner was based on my intelligence staff coming up with where are the gaps. And the gap was right up in the northeast, which is where the Tajiks were. And they were the ones who were starting to fire at us and put in IDs. Because why should we not if we're not getting any assistance? So that was my focus. However, across Afghanistan, I think we can safely say, the same sort of successes were not being achieved. And I'm not going to go into any detail. I've just read the Afghan papers. I would encourage anybody to read them. It's long, uh, but it is a, it's based on interviews, oral interviews, of a lot of Americans right down from Rums, the late Rum, Donald Rumsfeld through uh, the late Colin Powell, but it goes right through to his tactical commanders on the ground. And I have to say, most of them admit it was a disaster and they highlight their failures. I wish they'd done that at the time, as opposed to in retrospect. What it comes down to is military commanders, people like me and Peter Wood, sometimes we have to tell our political masters the truth. Unfortunately, sometimes that means you get sacked, as did with a couple of American generals. But otherwise, we're heading towards disaster. So why? Similar to Timor-Leste, again, timeline, Western, Western approach, legal system, which was then corrupt. And they were able to corrupt it very quickly, whereas they'd had their own traditional system. I'm not saying it was right, but it had been developed and seemed to work for them, etc., etc. I've done a lot of study and a lot of research into um, why some counterinsurgencies have succeeded and others have failed. And there is one principle which I'm sure all of you in this room are well aware of, and that is if you have got a safe haven across a border, uh, it's very difficult to actually have an effective counterinsurgency campaign. And for reasons known best to the, to the Pakistan authorities, on one hand it could be because the last thing they wanted was a, 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 a Taliban force which was actually going to attack them, um, and, and secondly, obviously, there are religious issues, etc. The other one is um, understanding Afghan history, culture. Thank you very much for inviting me on this, on the, on this uh, lecture because I um, was able to have dinner with all those Afghans who I managed to uh, evacuate over the last uh, 18 months to two years, which I did as a private citizen, to, be, to, to tell you, to inform you. But um, it's interesting. They talk about the different streams of culture, the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, the Sunni, the Shiite, the Hazara. I, I don't read that in some of the military campaign planning. And, and we really have to learn from that lesson. And it's the same in our own nation. And then if you're going to, if you're going to negotiate with the Taliban, which we probably should have done at the Doha talks in 2001, um, do it earlier than later. Um, because by the time we did negotiate, we're on a timeline. 
which was similar to the Obama surge timeline of, I'm going to put in 100,000, but we're all out in 18 months' time. You, you're just, you know, they've got, they've got the time. We've got the clocks. So uh, how long have I got now? Sorry. <laughs> two minutes. Great. Um, so I'm just going to give you two, two, two high points, really. The first one is mandate opportunities. Um, my father was a wonderful man. He spent most of his life in Africa, which is where I was brought up. And he always talked about res solutions, not resolutions. Get out on the ground and do something. Don't just write documents. That was the Mira Hux. I remember when she got me, when I took over. She said, Martin, I've got this mandate. And it says, we're going to provide you a security sector. Go out there and do whatever you need to do to get the FFDTL working with the PNTL, working with government. Yeah? Get the confidence between the leaders. Get them some peacekeeping operations, et cetera, et cetera. Let's use them as opportunities. The other one is dispersed locations. In Afghanistan, most of the coalition forces patrolled out of their secure bases, came home by last light, not New Zealand, I have to add, by last light, and then the Taliban moved into the spaces. If you read the campaign in Malaysia, the Malayan campaign, they brought the populations into those safe, safe spaces so they couldn't be influenced. That's not to say that they shouldn't be influenced. And then the final one is in relation to local solutions um, and the use of local forces and hybrid missions similar to what you see in <coughs> Africa between the African Union and, and UN forces. Is that I always use the example, and I'll finish on this, and that was in 2006, and Ruth knows this better than I do, and I'm hoping I'm quoting it right. But um, there was this massive refugee issue. People were scared. They went to Ruth's place. They went into various schools in around Dili. Some of them went back to, into the hills. They thought, and I've seen the, seen the coverage, they thought that we were going to mess it up for them again. Yeah? In Beyond that point, though, some of them just didn't want to leave Dili. They didn't want to leave that safety. And so um, there was a conundrum. The UN was thinking, how can we get them out? And um, the Timorese came back and said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll all give them $500 in that region. And that will give them the ability to get the materials to go back and build their houses, which had all been burned, right? And, of course, the UN in its, its rules and regulations said, no, no, we can't do that. And the government of the day in Timor said, yes, we will do that. And it worked. So there are local solutions. Always listen to local solutions. And I think that was the lesson which came out from us before lunch. So thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed the opportunity of listening to all the other speakers. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of my journey. And um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.